Uh, let's find a place to sit. And uh, actually, let's stand, and we'll start with our first song. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Again. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you, so I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. face. Sorry, I'm having a coughing fit up here. <coughs> oh, my voice is dry. Uh, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the moisture. We, we really need it. And just ask, Father, that you bless this service. Thank you that we can be here and worship and praise your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to welcome you to Bridge Bible Fellowship. Uh, we're going to continue in, in song, then we'll have uh, some announcements, and we'll have some more songs, and Martin's going to give the message today. And so let's, uh, let's continue. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength the rises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, He reign forever. Our hope, our strong delight. Oh, 
everybody. Uh, welcome to Bridge Bible Fellowship. For those who don't know me, my name is Dan Mershon. I'll be leading you through announcements today. Uh, if you could turn your attention to this green bulletin, um, there's actually a lot in here today. One of them, uh, just briefly, is the, uh, the prophet class. Um, that's meeting every other Sunday, so it will meet next week in that building uh, just out back. Um, second, and this is a, a new announcement, hasn't been on here recently and it's coming up quickly and that is if anybody is interested in dancing uh, there is a well join us March 5th um, well, I'll point you here the details are all there so and then um, finally so the uh, the e free church of the Palouse they host a men's retreat um, it's March 25th through 27th that says multi-church events been taking place for a number of years and the uh, uh, Larbacks have been um, asked to cook again this year. They've been doing that several years, and they're looking for volunteers to help with it. So if you are interested in helping to cook for the uh, men's retreat, please talk to Evan and Janine. All right, um, so this week we'll be continuing our journey through Matthew. Last week, Lauren, uh, Lauren spoke about the sign of Jonah, and there, there was a lot in that sermon. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me is, uh, and this is, I think the reason this stood out to me is because I had spent many, many years really struggling with faith. And uh, that was the story of when the, um, the Pharisees are kind of questioning Jesus and they're asking him for a sign. They write, perform, you're the Messiah, perform some miracle, um, show, you know, show us. And, and it kind of ignores the fact that he had just performed a whole bunch of public miracles, right? And, uh, and we kind of have this tendency to think, if only there was some obvious sign, it would be so much easier to trust in God. I mean, I, you don't have to raise your hand, but it, you think, have you ever thought that before, maybe? <laughs> and uh, I know I've said that to myself, and uh, the truth is, though, it's not that simple. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a parallel to this in the Old Testament. Um, one of the uh, pastors at one of my previous churches pointed out, and that's, uh, that's in Exodus. So, right, Moses, Moses parts the sea, all the Israelites follow him. There's a big miracle, not to mention all the plagues on the Egyptians. There were some, you call those miracles, right? Um, everybody's out starving in the desert. God rains bread from the skies, and uh, everybody is thirsty. Moses strikes a rock, and water comes forth. And then when they're at, everybody's around Mount Sinai, uh, Moses, or the Lord says to Moses, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, basically, I'm going to come down to you in a thick cr cloud, three days' time. Everybody gathers below the mountains. There's big thunder. Everybody's trembling at the awe of God. And then, like, two seconds later, they're, they're making a golden calf to worship. And, 
and we have to ask, like, are we actually any different than that? Are we any different than the Israelites or the Pharisees that in, in that regard, are there signs that we just ignore? And uh, the truth is, if, if we're not willing to trust in God, then no sign, big or small, is going to convince us otherwise. And, and one thing I've come to realize is, like, and I would argue, is that God's signs are all around us if we're willing to open our eyes and see them. Um, so when I know, when I look back at pivotal moments in my life, there are things, you know, on an individual level, you could probably just brush it away as luck, but, but taken all together, there are so many things that are just, they seem so purposeful that I have a hard time believing that they happen purely by chance. Um, and I suspect that any of us take an honest look at our past, we would probably see something similar. We would see God's hand at work. All right, let us pray. Dear God, please... Open our eyes so that we recognize your work, and please give us the courage to trust in you, especially when it's most difficult. Please let us not only listen to you, but internalize Martin's message today so that it is reflected in the way that we choose to live. In your son's name we pray, amen. Uh, children are released. Well, as the children are going down, I'd like to make a plug. So I'm going to make a plug here for the, the praise team. Uh, praise team is not only what you see up front, but what you, what's in the back that you don't see. They're the people that when things go wrong up here, even though it's my fault, you turn around and look at them. Uh, that's just the way it works, right, guys? So I'm going to make a plug for it. If you want to be part of this praise team, worship music, singing, playing an instrument, running the sound, running the, um, uh, the video, um, talk to me. T talk to me either between services or after the last service or at 4 o'clock today. We're having a, a meeting here as well. So if you want to use your talents for our Lord Jesus Christ and to, uh, to uh, um, bless the saints here, talk to me. Okay. Let's, uh, let's rise and let's continue and worship here. <laughs>
sing this together. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Lord, please light the fire that was but wide and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. Oh, Lord. song before Martin comes up. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. When I feel afraid and think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. To my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can be seated. Thank you, Bob <laughs> and team. Um, I want to tell you about my sister. She had a four-year-old kid. And well, that was a long time ago. But she was really concerned there was some kind of medical issue with his hearing. And she went to a number of different doctors uh, and specialists running th him through all kinds of hearing tests. And, and finally, uh, my mom told me, she said, yeah, the doctor called. And she said, the good news is that there's nothing wrong with his hearing. He can hear just fine. He's ignoring you, which <laughs> I thought was hilarious at the time. I did, <laughs> so, anyway, he had no serious hearing problem. And today we're going to be talking about hearing and listening. And you probably remember times, like I remember specifically my mom saying something to me like, why aren't you listening to me? I told you to clean your room. Why aren't you listening? And, and it's not that I wasn't listening. She meant why aren't you obeying me? 
That's what she meant. Why are you dismissing me? Why do you think you know better than me? Why, why are you despising me? Now, you might think it's kind of harsh to use the word despising. I don't feel like I was despising my own mom. But there's a story in the Old Testament of a guy named David who had sex with his friend's wife, got her pregnant, and then killed his friend to hide it up, to cover it over. And he was confronted by a prophet named Nathan, and Nathan said, you are despising God when you act like this. And so that is an is a appropriate word to use when you ignore someone. I don't know if you've ever felt despised by your dog when you call him, <laughs> and he goes the other way. And you're like, I'm going to kill that dog when I catch him. So <laughs> last week, Lauren talked about a number of things. I, I appreciate Dan's summary. That was great. He also ta he talked about um, the Ninevites and, and how they actually listened to a prophet and turned from their evil ways, and God spared the city. He also talked about uh, a, a queen from the middle of Africa who came all the way up to the land of Israel. And back in those days, I'm sure it was a lot of money and effort and time to do that, to listen to uh, God's words through Solomon. And uh, now God himself, Jesus, is walking the earth, and his, his, uh, he's getting a response. A lot of people are not listening to him. In fact, some of them are planning to kill him. And uh, Jesus mentioned at the end of last week, Lauren brought this up, that Jesus said, those that are the closest to me of all, closer than my mother and my brothers and my sisters, uh, it's those who do the will of God. And Lauren said, today we're starting with a series of parables that will give us some insight as to what is the will of God that Jesus was talking about, those that do the will of God. So that's what we'll be, be covering today. Um, and I have a confession to make. When I first got this assignment about doing this parable of the sower, and my wife is a quilter. It's not sewing with needle and thread. It's sowing seeds. That went through my mind a couple times. But at any rate, uh, when I found out I was going to do the parable of the sower, my heart sunk. I thought, I have heard this thing so many times. There's nothing more in there for me. Fortunately, I was very wrong. And I'm actually excited to share with you some of the things I found out today. But first, think of this. There's about 46 parables. And uh, this particular one is repeated three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all repeat it. So it's important from that sense that it was repeated many times. It's one of the very few that Jesus selected to actually explain. He wanted us to get this right. And um, it's for the major parables in Matthew, this one's at the top of the list. This is the first one. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. Let's pray before we start. Father, your words are a lamp, and your spirit is what gives the energy to that lamp so we can see. Help us to understand. Help us to listen. Help us to learn as we look at your words today, Lord. Please speak through me, and please give words from my mouth that will be useful and helpful for everyone here, including myself. Amen. So this whole passage starts off with, uh, let's see. Nope. <laughs> I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> okay. There we go. That same day. Uh, so that same day, and it was quite a day. I was trying to figure out what does that day encompass. Probably all of chapter 12 of Matthew. So a lot went on. But the key thing, there's a sea change going on. There's a major shift happening. And I'm not sure how many of the people are aware of this yet or not. But there was a battle starting. There's battle lines have been drawn between those religious folks who refused to listen to God. And God himself was walking the earth. That's the change that's happening. And that battle is starting. And so this is Jesus' first public speech after that has happened. And what is he going to be saying to this crowd? And I can assure you, he's not giving them a nifty little tool where they can say, oh, this person's shallow and this person's choked out and I'm a hundredfold Christian. He's not doing that. There's something much more that's here for all of us. Um, he's actually, he told the story twice, once to the crowd on the beach. And you can see here on this day, as it, it says on the screen, he uh, went down to the beach 
And my first thought is, oh, if I had a really, really hectic day and I live by the ocean or the sea, I go down and sit on the beach, chill out, be calm. But no, there's crowds all around. In fact, if you wonder how big those crowds are that are mentioned in this section, uh, Luke says he told the disciples to get a boat ready so that they wouldn't be crushed. This is rock concert style crowds that crush people. That's the kind of crowds. So Jesus was not exactly getting his little peaceful time on the beach. And he got in the boat, and at first I thought, well, if I was him, I'd just head out to the middle of the lake and just chill. He didn't do that. He stopped, and he started teaching, because we know from other passages in Scripture, he had compassion on all these people. So the first audience is this, this crowd on the beach. Every man is there. And it's, it's the day off. You know, there'd be some fishermen. They might be looking over at the nets thinking, boy, those things need prepared. But if I start working on those nets, those Pharisees are going to, you know, start scolding me. Or there's a, probably a nursing mother. There's someone in the back making jokes with his friend. There's some guy looking at some girl. You know, I, there's everything. This is a crowded beach. All kinds of people are out there. Um, and then there's a second audience that Jesus talks to. And those are the people that draw close to him when he explains a story and he, and he unpacks it for them uh, a little bit after this. And those of you who uh, are counting verses might notice there's a, a section in the middle that's skipped. So today we're going to be covering the story Jesus told to the crowd on the beach and then the story as he unpacked it to the disciples. The middle section is about parables in general and Kirk's going to be covering that next week. So Jesus is in this boat right here and he's talking He's scattering God's word out into the crowd. And what he says is, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. And the birds came and devoured them. And you've seen that around here during harvest time when a grain truck has a little excess and the grain falls on the highway and the birds are all pecking up the grain. You've seen that. And then he said, some seeds fell on the rocky ground. That's where there wasn't much depth of soil. And so they sprung up fast because they warmed up really quick in the spring and sprung up. But then when the sun rose, they got scorched because they didn't have any roots because there wasn't much soil. But since they didn't have a root, that's why they withered. And they turned brown and they crumbled to dust and blew away. And then there were some seeds that fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. And then there were some seeds that fell on the good soil and they produced grain some 100-fold, some 60-fold, and some 30-fold. And then he finishes by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, before we use the answer key that Jesus provides us to figure out what does this story mean exactly, there's some things to note about how he handles this story that I think will be helpful as you look at any parable. First of all, Notice that Jesus keeps this really short and simple. His explanation for you verse counters is only five verses long, whereas the story itself is eight verses. So he doesn't get overly elaborate. Second, he's connecting spiritual truth dot to dot. The seed, for example, is God's word. And the soil is our hearts. But he doesn't connect all the dots. There are some things that seem very important, like what is the root? Jesus doesn't tell us what the root is or what is the fruit. And I think it's an invitation for us to look at both at the real world of agricultural, what can we learn by thinking about this story, and the real spiritual world of the Bible. What does the Bible say about these truths? And we'll look at both. But I wanted to start out with the real world because um, you need to know about me. This, this is, oh, I, well, hmm. Sorry, I forgot to flip, I think. Uh, this thing. I didn't realize it switched off that picture, sorry. Okay, so um, when I was a kid, I was in 4-H and I took 4-H gardening and I loved it. My, my dad loved gardening, I, I caught that vibe from him. I, had, I got graph paper, and he told me that the corn would shade the shorter plants, and I graphed it out, and I did all this OCD stuff that I tend to do. Anyway, so I had this, this garden plan, and I loved it. Well, fast forward to today, I still have a garden, but you would really, if you knew what was going on, you'd have to question what I'm doing, because I'm a specialist at taking about 
$50 of inputs, seeds and fertilizer and compost, and, and harvesting maybe $20 worth of crops. <laughs> so I thought I probably should check with someone who knows a little bit better about how this agriculture thing works. So I talked to Tim Schultz, <laughs> and he, he agreed to talk to me. We visited for a couple hours, but that's a man who probably harvests in one month more than I've harvested in my entire life in terms of value of food. And so he had a lot of good insight. I'm not going to share the whole two-hour discussion, but I want to highlight three bullet points that we talked about. First of all, I did ask him, is it true that the shallow soil warms up faster and the plants spring up? He goes, yeah, that, that happens. He goes, but there's another thing. It sprouts fast, but it doesn't have much roots. And so when the sun comes up, and the sun, of course, is scorching the whole field, but the ones with no roots turn brown really fast. In fact, he said you can drive around here in June and look out in the fields, and you'll see these brown spots. And you know, that's where there's no roots. So that was one thing. Second thing, he said, I asked him about the weeds getting choked out. And, and how does that work? I said, does that kill the weeds? Does it, what happens? He said that most weeds are more vigorous than the plants. And so what happens is the weeds take away the nutrients. They take away the they shade. There's no sunshine. There's, they steal the water. And so that plant that's supposed to be producing crops is just a spindly little thing that doesn't produce hardly anything. Sometimes it's not even worth harvesting if there's enough roots. There's just nothing there, no production. And then speaking of production, as you have already seen my slides, uh, Jesus says, um, and this is at the end. I'm skipping around just a little bit. Uh, the top is what he said to the crowd on the beach. The bottom verse is what he said when he was unpacking this. He says, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, in another 30. And Tim and I talked about this, and we did the math, and he said, yeah, for sure. There are times he's planted one pound worth of wheat seed and got harvested a hundred pounds. That would be on a really good year. And other years, maybe average, it's about 60 pounds. Now, this is around here, and this is wheat. And then sometimes it's just 30 in a bad year. Um, the interesting thing I pondered about this is that I'm pretty sure he did the same amount of work for all of those different harvests. It's just that God's the one who's actually making the growth happen. And there's a lot outside of his control. Now, I compared Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew, what we're doing today, and Mark, both say the same thing, 100, 60, 30. I'm like, should I be making something out of this? Luke just says 100 to the crowd on the beach, and then when he's unpacking it, all he says is bears fruit. So I don't know what you want to make out of all of that, whether we're producing, you know, whether disciple, the fruit is producing disciples or the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. The bottom line is that producing something is important. If you produce nothing, that is a bad thing. So next we're going to go line by line through this explanation that, of this story that Jesus did. And it's pretty clear that Jesus is not just entertaining a crowd on the beach. He wants a response. So as we read through this, ah, uh, we're losing the church back there. <laughs> the, the, um, the, he wants a, a response. And ask yourself as I read through this, how does Jesus want me to respond? So this is the, the path. I'll read the bottom part. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. I don't know if you ever remember a parent saying to you, is what I'm saying to you not sinking in? That's what I think about this. This on the path, the seed's just sitting up there on top. Isaiah, the prophet, indicates that there's somewhat of a choice going on here. He, he scolds Israel for it and by saying, you chose not to understand. And Jeremiah, the prophet, he was speaking to the Israelites when the Babylonians, who were going to overrun their city, were on their doorsteps. And he says, listen, listen. He says it twice, and there's exclamation points in there. I don't know what's in the Hebrew, but there's exclamation points in English. Um, he said, your city, God has been persistently talking to you 
for hundreds and hundreds of years, and you won't listen. Therefore, your city is going to be a pile of rubble, and you're going to be lying in pools of blood. Well, a couple of years ago, I walked outside my house in the night, and there was a dog lying in a pool of blood. It was panting rapidly. It was laying in the middle of the street, and it had been hit by a car. And as I approached the dog, the owner came up and said, I called and I called, and my dog wouldn't listen. And I, that night, I learned the difference between a dying dog and a living dog is the living dog listened to its master. This is very significant. And so how do I understand, if I'm a person, if I'm thinking, I'm not understanding this. I've got three tips I've learned from my own life I'll share with you. Number one is if you have doubts about God, don't suppress them. When I was in junior high, I started having doubts about God. And, and it came into full bloom by the time I got to college. And I went off the rails and spent several years in a spiritual gutter. Um, it's because I was so afraid that if I questioned God's word and I expressed my doubts, the whole thing would crumble into nothingness. And where would I be? Well, what I found out is God's word is a rock. It can withstand anything, all kinds of criticism. But take it to someone who can help you. Don't, don't end up in the gutter like I did. Second thing is, how do we take our doubts to Jesus? You probably remember Lauren saying a couple weeks ago, about a month ago maybe, that when John the Baptist was in prison, he started having some doubts. And it's reasonable. It's like, I thought the Savior was coming to save us all, and here I am in prison. And he expressed those doubts, and he took them to Jesus. So that's what Lauren said. Note very carefully what John did with his doubts. He took them to Jesus. So you might wonder, how do I take my doubts to Jesus or to God? Well, for starters, read God's word. Nate made the comment during his sermon that Jesus jabbed the religious folks a couple times by saying, have you not read? Well, clearly they'd all read, but they hadn't listened. They hadn't obeyed. Um, God expects us to read his word. Don't despise God by ignoring it. And read with prayer. Jesus' brother James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Ask him without doubting, and he will, he will uh, help you. Uh, Paul tells us that the Spirit of God helps us to understand. And the other thing you can do, so my third tip is memorize Scripture. If, I don't know how many of you would order a very expensive item online, and it shows up on your doorstep by FedEx, and then you just leave it there for a couple of weeks before you pick it up. Of course not. You're like, when's it coming? You're checking on your phone. I'm going to grab it as soon as it's there. You don't want anyone stealing that valuable package off your porch. So... Taking God's word in to your house is like memorizing it. Lock it in. And if you say to yourself, I'm terrible at memorizing, I assure you, there's no way you're more terrible than me. One time, Julie, my wife, said, I don't know of anyone else who can sing a song a thousand times while I was learning to play the guitar and still not be able to tell you the words of that song without the piece of paper in front of me. So uh, if you want a kind of a firsthand memorization for dummies, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you all my tips so you can do it. But in the end, this section, I think, we can know absolutely for sure what is God's will in our life. He wants us to listen up, to listen for understanding. And all of those other things that you worry about, is this God's will that I propose to this woman, that I accept this job, that I leave this town, that I discipline my child in that way? All those other things pale in comparison to listening to God. So listen to understand. Let it sink in. Listen up. David tells us in Psalm 53 that God is looking for those who understand. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, and immediately receives it with joy. And yet, he has no root in himself. But he endures for a little while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the key to surviving the scorching heat or, uh, of trials 
or troubles or persecution or the time of testing, as Luke puts it, is deep root. If you don't have roots when life gets rocky and the heat is turned up, you will burn out. You will wither away. And if you need a sobering reminder of that, look for those brown spots in the field that Tim was talking about this June. So exactly what are the roots? Well, in the real world, the, the plant needs the roots to draw water and nutrients for survival. But what's the spiritual connection? Now keep in mind, the audience on the beach may have been familiar with a number of passages from the Old Testament. Some of them probably went to the synagogue every week. Some, maybe not so much. But um, these, these passages may have been familiar to them. So I'm going to take a look briefly into the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm uh, 1 says, Listen with delight or with expectation. Now keep in mind the creator of the universe wrote this stuff, and it's going to be good. The man who delights in the law is like a tree planted by a stream that yields its fruit, and its leaf does not wither. Isaiah talks about a man who looks to God for guidance. And here's what he finds, that he, their desire will be satisfied in the scorched places. And then finally, we, we read about trust. Jeremiah tells his listeners, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, and it, for its leaves remain green, and it's not anxious in the year of drought, nor does it cease to bear fruit. Keep in mind that the people listening to Jeremiah had plenty of reason to be fearful and anxious because the, they were surrounded by the Babylonian army. And Jeremiah had told them that your life, as you know it, is about to end. And to sum up, the crowd on the beach likely knew that roots were linked with delighting in God's law, expecting good things, looking for guidance, and trusting God. That's what I think roots means. Another comment on roots is that uh, the roots are the invisible, critical part. Unless you have a shovel and kill the plant. You can't tell how many roots are there. Um, Amos the prophet said, I destroyed its fruit above and its roots below. Hosea the prophet said, the root is dried up and they produce no fruit. And there's a more hopeful one in 1 Kings. The remnant shall take root downward and bear fruit upward. So in the physical world, roots and fruit are very much connected. You don't have uh, fruit without the roots. And just as a plant sinks its roots down for survival, so we too can survive spiritually by sinking deep roots. When the heat is turned up, and if we sink our roots in trust, expecting good guidance into Jesus and his word. Another thing about roots is they must be grown in advance. You probably all remember that heat wave that hit last summer. And if I was a plant sitting out there in the field getting scorched by the sun, it's a little bit late one week into this thing, hmm, maybe now's the time to start sending down roots. That's too late. The roots are something you do in advanced preparation. So if you want to be a prepper, this is what I advise. Well, back to today's text. Um, I've already had this up before. I'm not going to read it again. But before we leave this section, I'd, I'd just like to leave you with three tips. Uh, first of all, Read God's word with expectation, not with an eye roll. Not like I did when I first heard, oh, you have parable of the sower. More like, oh, I can't wait to see what I find in here. Be convinced that God's word is full of good things. Um, if you have some doubts about whether the Bible is true, whether it's been uh, translated so many times that it's not worthwhile anymore, read a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I found that book tremendously helpful for me when I had those kind of struggles. Also be prepared to work at it. I met a guy once who was an engineer and he uh, had a job in Mexico and when he's down in Mexico he heard there was uh, gold buried by some bandit in the hills so he rented a bunch of heavy equipment and spent a lot of time digging for this heavy equipment and he said well I never did find any treasure but I learned two things about treasure hunting. You've got to know that it's there and it's going to take a lot of work. 
The third tip is read or listen to the Bible frequently. If you don't make the time to read the Bible to yourself, to your spouse, you're, you are making poor choices. If you're only relying on 30 minutes of Scripture here on Sunday, once a week, you're on a starvation diet. So listen deeply. This section is about being choked out. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Here's a person who took root and was growing just fine, but somewhere along the way got distracted and stopped listening and turned to other things. I found this book this morning. I wasn't even sure I had it. My dad gave this to me when I was age nine. I would probably bet there's no other nine-year-old that got this book. Weeds of Western Washington. <laughs> my, my dad hated weeds. I heard about it all the time. And, and he said, the weeds steal the sunlight. They steal the water. They steal the nutrients. They, they kill that crop or shrink it down so much that it's unproductive, totally unproductive. We started out listening to God, but we got distracted by the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, and then we stopped listening. And we stopped learning, and we stopped obeying. It happened to Judas, who hung out with Jesus and the disciples. In fact, Judas is here with these guys right while Jesus is unpacking this. And Judas fell away when things got tough. One of my favorite examples of this is the story of Mary and Martha. So Martha is having Jesus over for dinner. And she is frantic, vacuuming the floor, wiping off the counter, dusting everything, trying to make the best food possible. And Martha's sister, Mary, is just sitting there doing nothing. Nothing. And Martha got so ticked off, she said to Jesus, who Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, Jesus, make my, do make my sister come and help me in the kitchen. And Jesus said, Martha, you are so worried about so many things. There's only one thing that's important, and Mary has found it, and it will not be taken from her. Don't get distracted like Martha. Listen long and keep listening and never stop all, life, all your life. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all finish this parable with this punchline. This is what was ringing in the ears of the crowd when Jesus finished this story. He who has ears, let him hear. And this parable has two messages. I think there's one for the crowd on the beach and one for the disciples who would soon be sowing seed into hearts. And for everyone, there's this message of hope, but also of warning. I told you the story of the dog bleeding out on the street, but there's another dog story that's much more hopeful. Um, at the time I was there, our dog was in the house, and our dog was very, very good at listening, which is good because we live on a busy street. Well, busy for Moscow. And um, we, uh, that dog lived 17 years and had a long and productive life for a dog. And that's the hope for us, is that we can be productive, but we've got to be involved in the process. So the summary for everyone on the beach is listen up, listen down, and listen long. Never stop. And you can be absolutely sure that is God's will for you. And for those with Jesus who will be imitating by spreading the words of God's kingdom, there is a second message. We are in a battle. And not all will respond. In fact, many will fall away. Some will get burned out. Some will get choked out. And can you imagine how discouraging it was to the disciples when Judas flaked out? You know, as the crisis was drawing to a head. But as Jesus told them, take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, your words are so good. 
I feel so uh, inadequate to put your words out there. Lord, I trust that your spirit will stir up my heart and the hearts of all here who are listening, that, that we would be hearers and that we would be listeners and that we would be doers of your word. Lord, thank you for giving us your words and not leaving us with nothing. You left us with your words and your spirit to help us understand. Thank you for being willing to teach us, Lord. Thank you for your love and help these words to ring in our ears all this week as we think of how they apply to our own lives. Amen. Thanks, Martin. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, stand up and we'll sing our last song here. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns oh he reigns it's all god's children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns oh he reigns let it rise above the four winds caught up in the heavenly sound let praises echo from Towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's, God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, oh, he reigns, it's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, oh, he reigns. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard, cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word one more time and all the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word it's all God's children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns he reigns it's all god's children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns he reigns it's all god's children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns Father, you do reign. We know that. We know you sing. You um, sit on the throne. Father, and I just ask that we remember those words. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And just go out. Remember that there are people that haven't heard um, about Jesus or they've heard, but they're just still in doubt. We just ask that as you bring those people across our paths that we're able to talk to them and show them your love. Thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. It's all God's children singing glory, glory.